All right, y'all, first things first, um, I want to comment very briefly on uh, Mr. Cummings' passing. Uh, uh, for those of you who know, I was uh, in Congress for a couple years with Mr. Cummings and uh, on the committee with him. I uh, had a chance to work with him on a day-in, day-out basis, and uh, he, will be, he will be missed. He was. He was uh, a classy guy, and I enjoyed much working with him, and uh, the condolences uh, from uh, my family and all of the White House uh, group to his family today. He will be, uh, he will be sorely missed. Um, now, getting on to the business at hand, I understand it's been a fairly slow news week, so uh, I thought we'd introduce a couple of things. I did want to come out here with my Nationals hat on, uh, but they told me that that would violate some type of rule, so I couldn't do that. I was also going to wear my Montreal Expos hat, and then they said that would be foreign interference in the World Series, so we can't do that either. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the G7. Uh, we talk about uh, where we're going to do it. We're going to announce today that we're going to do the 46th G7 Summit um, on uh, June 10th through June 12th at the Trump National Doral uh, facility in Miami, Florida. Uh, the focus of the event um, will be uh, global growth and challenges to the global economy. Specifically, we're dealing with things like uh, rejuvenating incentives for growth and prosperity, rolling back uh, prosperity killing regulations, ending trade barriers, and reopening energy markets. So taking a lot of what we have been doing here domestically uh, with such success and trying to encourage the rest of the world to get on board. As we sit here and our economy does so well, you look all across the world right now and the rest of the world is either at or near recession. Um, and we really do think that we have hit on a formula that works not only here, but that would work overseas. We're going to take the G7 as the opportunity to try and convince other nations uh, that they can have the same successes by following the same model. Now, let's talk about the site selection process, because I know you folks will have some questions about that. How do we go about doing this? Uh, first of all, we use a lot of the same criteria uh, that have been used by past administrations. There's a long list of the accommodations on site, uh, the, the, uh, the, the ballrooms, bilateral rooms, the number of rooms, the photo ops, the support hotels that are there, the, the proximity to cities and airports, uh, helicopter landing zones, medical facilities, etc. Um, so we use the same set of criteria that previous administrations have used. Uh, we started with a list of about a dozen um, just on paper. Uh, and we sent an advanced team out to actually visit 10 locations in uh, several states. We uh, visited uh, California, Colorado, Florida, Hawaii, Michigan, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, and Utah. Uh, we got that list down to just under 10, uh, and the advanced team went out to visit those. And from there, we got down to four finalists that our senior uh, team went out to, to look at. They looked at, uh, I think it was one in Hawaii, uh, two in Utah, and then the, uh, the Mar-a-Lago facility uh, in Florida. And uh, it became apparent at the end of that process um, that Doral was by far and away, far and away, the best physical facility uh, for this meeting. In fact, uh, I was talking to one of the advance teams when they came back, and I said, what was it like? And he said, Mick, you're not going to believe this, but it's almost like they built this facility to host this type of event. If any of you have been there, um, you know that there's, there's separate buildings um, with their own rooms uh, separate and apart from each building, so that one country could have a building, another country could have another, you folks could have your building for the press, um, and obviously the, the common areas are, 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 are going to be perfect for our needs down there. Uh, again, anticipating your questions, um, how, is this, uh, how is this not an emoluments uh, violation? How is, how, is the President going to profit from this? Um, I think the President has pretty much made it very clear since he's got here um, that he doesn't profit from being here, he has no interest in profit from being here. It's one of the reasons that he's not taken a salary since he's been here, he's given that salary uh, to charity, will not be profiting here. Um, we had talked about the possibility of, of whether or not the president could actually do it at, at no cost. They understand there's difficulties with doing it that way. Um, but we also have difficulties, obviously, if they charge market rates. So they're doing this at cost. As a result, it's actually going to be dramatically cheaper for us to do it at Doral as, at, uh, compared to the, uh, the other final sites um, that we had. Um, so we're looking forward to that uh, to that to that uh, to that meeting uh, again June 10th through 12th of next year for the 46 G7. Now my guess is uh, with that uh, official part of the briefing finished, there's going to be some questions about a variety of things that are going on in the world. So if we can do something together, that would be great. Can we take the questions about the G7 first? <laughs> Go through those, um, and then we'll take a chance to maybe ask a couple questions about the other stuff uh, before uh, before the end of the day. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, how is this not just an enormous conflict of interest for the president to host the G7 at his home resort? And how will the president continue to criticize the Biden family for self-dealing at the same time he's doing this? Uh, okay, a couple different things. Uh, first off, you're not making any profit. We, I think we've already established that. Uh, I think some. 
opportunity. It's a huge. I've heard. You know, I've heard that. I've heard that before. Um, you know, I've, I guess I've been the, the chief now for about nine or ten months, and I always hear it. Whenever we go to Mar-a-Lago, it's a huge branding opportunity. Whenever he plays, uh, you know, at Trump Mar-a-Lago, we play golf at Trump Bedminster. He goes to play golf at Trump up in Sterling, um, and everybody asks the question: Is it not a huge marketing opportunity? I would simply ask you all to to, to consider the possibility that Donald Donald Trump's brand is probably strong enough as it is, and he doesn't need any more help on that. This is not like it's it's the most recognizable name in the English language and probably around the world right now. So no, that's the, that has nothing to do with it. That's why, I, listen, I was skeptical. I was. I was, I was aware of the political sort of uh, criticism that we come under for doing it at Doral, um, which is why I was so surprised when the, when the advance team called back and said that this is the perfect physical location to do this. So I get the criticisms. So does he. Uh, face it, he'd be criticized regardless of what he chose to do. But no, there's no issue here on him profiting from this in any way, shape, or form. What's the difference? between this and what we're talking about, the Bidens. Um, uh, well, first of all, there's no profit here. Clearly, there's profit to the Bidens. And second of all, I think if there's one difference that you look at between the Trump family and the Biden family, Trump family made their money before they went into politics. That's a big difference. Yes, sir. Do you, uh, you said it's going to be done at cost. Do you have any idea of cost estimate, how much money you're looking at? And also, will it remain a G7, or do you envision Russia going out? Yeah, uh, I don't have the numbers in, in terms of the cost. I do know that it was, uh, there was uh, one of the ones I saw was it was almost half as much here. I, I don't want to butcher the numbers, but it was millions of dollars cheaper by doing it at Doral than it was at another facility, and that was roughly 50 percent uh, savings. Um, as to the G7, G8, look, that, that discussion is ongoing. The president has been very candid about that, about whether or not he wants to have Russia join the, the, the G7 again. They used to be members of that organization. Um, and I think he's been fairly straightforward, uh, not only to you folks, but to other leaders around the world, which is we go to the G7 and what dominates so much of the discussion? Russia. Okay. Russian energy, Russian, Russian military policy, uh, the Russian economy, it dominates a lot of the discussion. Wouldn't it be better to have them inside and have and as part of those conversations? But I think that decision will be made later uh, and we'll continue to review it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. G7 has been held for decades. So how can you make the argument that this is the best place to hold it? Surely there were other places that this could be held. And you can't make the argument that the president's not going to profit because we can't know how much he might profit um, in the future, right? Yeah. Um, to your first point, um, again, I think I've added the profit one. Again, it's, it's, he's not making any money off of this, just like he's not making any money from working here. And uh, if you think it's going to help his brand, that's great, but I would suggest that he probably doesn't need much help promoting his brand. So we'll put the profit one aside and deal with a perfect place. I mean, who was here for the last time was at Camp David? Was that the perfect place? In fact, I understand the folks who participated in it hated it. I thought it was a miserable place to have the G7. It was way too small. It was way too remote. My understanding is the media didn't like it because you had to drive an hour in a bus to get there either way. I take your point, but there have been other G7 summits. I've t attended yeah. numerous G7 summits that have been well, look, perfectly we, we, fine according to the leaders. We looked at we. Them. How can the White House really make the argument that this was the only place that the G7 summit could be? It's not the only place. It's the best place. Those are two different things, okay? Um, but we had there dates. Other good places without the There's plenty of other good places in this country to hold a large event. There's no question about it. Some of the limitations, we wanted it at a specific time. We wanted it in early June, so that limits it a little bit. Then there's other, there's, there's difficulties with going various places. Some places don't have the transportation that you need. I mean, there was one place, I won't say where it was, where we actually had to figure out if we were going to have to have oxygen tanks for the participants because of the altitude. So yeah, there's, there's, just, there's limitations at other places. We thought of the 12 places that we looked at, and you'd recognize the names of them if we told you what they were, that this was by far and away the best choice. Yes, ma'am. Very quickly, this is, this is a business business of optics, how is the president going to stand on a debate stage if, in fact, Vice President Biden wins yeah. the nomination and try to make an argument that he profited off of his vice presidency? He's going to do that extraordinarily well. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So you were talking about how this is this is the best place or yeah. one of the best places to have this. Okay. So is this going to be self-contained just at Doral? Are there uh, other hotel rooms you think you'll have to get? Or is there anywhere else that you'll, you'll have yeah, to get? Yeah, one of the advantages, I understand one of the advantages that the, the advance team came back with about Doral was the fact that it could be sequestered off from the rest of the city and that nearly all or all of the operations could be on that one piece of property. I think there's, I think the president said there's almost 900 acres there. So it's a huge facility um, and we'll be able with a lot of open space. I think there's three golf courses. So there's a, there's a lot of space available to us. And we do anticipate the entire thing being on that campus. Now, including it, the hotel, including hotels, I've talked about additional hotel rooms. You can go up to get additional yeah. hotels involved in that. 
Yeah, I would. Well, I would again. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the. Uh, when we talk about the, the, the delegations, for example, when we went um, to uh, where we be a Ritz, okay, I think we were at two or three different hotels uh, around that city. Uh, that would not be the case here. The American delegation would stay on campus. The British delegation will stay on campus. The, the Germans will stay on campus. Whether and you folks will be there. Whether or not there'll be other folks who are using up hotel rooms in the in the Miami area, I, I can't speak to that. Local authorities. What local authorities have you been in contact with about this? Yeah, I haven't asked that question, but we do that as part of the advance team. We'll do that with each of the groups that we work with, uh, but I'm not familiar with those. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, a video shown last weekend at that resort, uh, actually a doctor video showed the president killing uh, members yeah. of the news media and his political opponents. Why do you think he hasn't spoken directly about the sentiment behind that video? Have you, have you asked him? Sure. I mean, you guys face Oh, but now that we but we put out a statement. You had you had a chance to ask him that question yesterday, and you asked him something else, which is fine. But, uh, but hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Your question was why he hasn't asked. It. We did as a as a White House. We we listen. That we didn't like that. I think we condemned that. He's That's not. He's the president. He has like do you? Think we didn't. What, what is we did not. Did you think that we would? I mean, that, that doesn't sound like a very strong condemnation. Oh come on, John. I mean, I mean that was, was it was it was awful. Was the, 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 I mean, I remember seeing the movie. No, no, we, we, we that has no place here. I, I think we think video? we've condemned that. I don't know if he's seen it or not. I have. Well, yes, sir. Understand that you're trying to. Put it in a place that you think is the best, yeah. and maybe save the taxpayers some money, which is important for all of us. But sometimes you, because of the appearance of impropriety, yeah. you don't make that call. Can you at least understand and acknowledge that the just the appearance of impropriety makes this wince-inducing, and maybe this is something that you want to reconsider? How did that conversation go in the room? Yeah, uh, the, the president knows that. Uh, listen, the president. We know the environment we live in. You all know the environment that we live in. And he knows exactly that he's going to get these questions and exactly get that reaction from a lot of people. And he's simply saying, okay, that's fine. I'm willing to take that. The same way he takes it when he goes to Trump Mar-a-Lago, the same place when he goes to play Trump Bedminster. He got over that a long time ago. He, he, we absolutely believe this is the best place to have it. We're going to have it there. And there's going to be folks who will never get over the fact that it's a Trump property. We get that. Uh, but we're still going to go there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Mulvaney. Aside from what your advance team did to look for the perfect place, yeah. what role did the president play in selecting Durrell, including getting it on the initial list of 10 or 12 places in the first place? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. We sat around one night. We were back in the dining room and uh, going over it with a couple of our advance team. We had the list. And he goes, what about Durrell? And I was like, that's that's but not the craziest the idea. It, it makes perfect sense. I'm f we're all familiar with it, so it's not like he said, "Oh, by this is what Doral is." I have to explain it. He said, "No, what about Doral?" Like, you know what? That's not the craziest idea we ever heard. We sent down and went go look at it. Yes, sir. Yes, thanks, Mick. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, as it relates to this decision that, that you've made uh, as the host country. Uh, couldn't the president simply, as the host country, invite President Putin? to represent Russia at the G7? Um, yeah, yeah, I think we can, because I think we, the, the, so, as I understand how the G7 works, there will be other leaders there anyway. Uh, for example, I met with uh, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, at the G7, even though they're not there. I assume he came at the invite of President Macron, and we could do the same thing. But in terms of, I think the question I got originally was turning it from the G7 into the G8. Okay. My question was, could he simply invite President Putin to attend? Well, I think he probably, yes. If the question is, can he physically do that? Yeah, no, I think he can. Well, not, whether he can first he can, he's president. But would he consider doing that? I, that's a, it really it's not come up. I think the conversation we've had about whether or not we turn it from the G7 to the G8, that could be an intermediate step. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that the president is willing to take the criticism uh, on this. But what about the country itself? Is there any value to sending a, a message to the world, especially given that all that's happened with foreign interference and attempts at foreign interference in our country? that this president in this country is not open for the kind of self-dealing that happens in other countries. Is that not an important message to send when you're inviting the world to come here to the United States? No. What's your question? I have a non-G7 question. Any G7, any last G7 questions? I got one more. About the G7 property, yeah. a couple of things. When you yeah. say it's the best property for this to take place, so yeah. the first question is, why has no other G7 ever been held there before? Yeah, because they didn't go look at it. So, uh, I don't know. I, why, why do they have it at Camp David? I mean, seriously, I mean, for those of you who are there, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with it. I've talked to the folks up at Camp David because I was up there recently and asked, I said, didn't you guys hope, I think it was a G8 back then, 2004, something like that. And they said it was a complete disaster. I'm like, okay, I wonder how that happened. How did that decision get made? Last, last 
Last you seven question, then, if I can. You were yeah. talking about the president's uh, this video where the president was seen shooting members of the media and others. Yeah. That was played at the Doral property there. They said that we haven't had the chance to ask him that question yet, which we have. But broadly, the president has tweeted 45,000 times. 45,000 times. How come the president hasn't used that Twitter account to more than 60 million followers to condemn it? You're his chief of staff. Yeah, the White House put out a statement about it. I mean, that's because he's tweeted 45,000 times. The next time you ask him, you got, again, it's not like the man hides from you, folks. Okay, I think he's done almost a hundred face-to-face uh, -face interviews with you. Okay, anybody else on G7? Is there any precedent in your studying of the G7 of a G7 summit being held at a, at a property owned by the president or a president? And my second question is, as you're looking at the content of what you want to do next year, it's yeah. probably going to be hot uh, in Florida in June. Will climate change be one of the issues that you discussed? Uh, the first question is, no, I don't know if another president has ever done I don't know if another president has owned a property that was even considered for G7. So, no, we haven't. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, climate change will not be uh, on the agenda. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, president Trump has called for the exposure of the whistleblower on Ukraine. Are we uh, done so on G7 then? Is that, is oh, that yes. the collective, is that the collective will? Um, yep. I got one gentleman. That, yes, sir. Go ahead. Last one on G7. Well, you began your remarks talking about the passing of Mr. Cummings. Yeah. Just, just to show the American people that this is above board, are you going to share documents that show how you arrived at this decision with the Congress? No, but I would imagine we, we, would, we would share uh, dollar figures with you afterwards. I mean, that's 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 ordinary course of business. That shows the merits but, of By the way, you're going to get this answer a lot. Okay, is, I, I don't talk about how this place runs on the inside. So if you ask us, if you want to see our paper on how we did this, the answer is absolutely not. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, there will almost certainly be a House Judiciary Committee hearing about this site selection. Do you think Jerry so? Nadler has, has already talked about that. Will, do, you know, do you really think so? Do you think they have time really to do that? So. Yeah. Will the administration participate, cooperate with that? Uh, you know, that's a, that's by the way, that's a fascinating question. I'd not thought that, 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 that this would prompt a, a, a Judiciary Committee investigation. And on one hand, I'm thinking to myself, they don't have time to do it uh, because they're too busy doing uh, impeachment, right? And then I think to myself, no, this is entirely consistent um, with how they've spent the first 18 months in office, right? Or 12 months, however long they've been here. I guess it's been a year, right? Um, that, yeah, they'd rather do that than talk about, um, tax policy, then talk about drug policy, then talk about opioids, talk about health care. Um, so that's a fascinating question. I don't know if there will be a Judiciary Committee inquiry into this. My guess is there probably will be, and we'll look forward to participating in it. Is anybody, this is all, these are all G7 questions are now, now. Okay, now we're moving on to something else. Um, so who hasn't asked, John Carl has not asked a question yet. Uh, so actually a clarification on, on your first statement on the G7, you said five finalists and you said Mar-a-Lago yeah, was, was uh, one of the finalists? Today? Yeah, four finalists, I think. We, we, we started with 12 um, on a, sort of a list. Um, with the team visited, the, the, the sort of a, a, a first team visited 10 of those, and I think I identified the states. We then got our senior team down, uh, and they visited four, of which Mar-a-Lago was one. There was one in Hawaii and so, two in Utah. So, so, so you're telling me that in the entire United States, you came down to four finalists, and two of them were Trump properties? No, one. Mar -a -Lago. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I miss okay. Dur Dural. 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 Just yes. Dural. I'm sorry. Yes. No. Okay. So, 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 so. Mar no, Mar-a-Lago was not involved. Mar-a-Lago was not close to being sufficient thank for the G7. You, I'm sorry. Did thank I, you. Thank you for clarifying. If so, I said Mar-a-Lago uh, about where we visited, and it was Dural, I apologize. Okay, the record is corrected. Uh, All right. So, uh, to, to, to the uh, question of Ukraine. Um, yeah. Can, can you clarify? And I've been trying to get an answer to this. Was the president serious? when he said that he would also like to see China investigate the Bidens. And you were directly involved in the decision to withhold funding uh, from uh, Ukraine. Can you explain to us now definitively why? Why was funding withheld? Sure, I'll deal, let's deal with the second one first. Uh, which is, look, it should come as no surprise to anybody. The last time I was up here, I've been, I haven't done this since I was chief of staff, right? Last time I was up here, some of you folks remember, it was for the budget briefings, right? And one of the questions y'all always ask me about the budget is, what are y'all doing to the foreign aid budget? Because we, 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 we absolutely gutted it, right? President Trump is not a big fan of foreign aid. Never has been, still isn't. Doesn't like spending money overseas, especially um, when it's poorly spent. Um, and that is exactly what drove this decision. Um, I've been in the office a couple times with him talking about this. He said, look, Mick, um, this is a corrupt place. Everybody knows it's a corrupt place. 
By the way, put this in context. This is on the heels of what happened in Puerto Rico when we took a lot of heat for not wanting to give a, a bunch of aid to Puerto Rico because we thought that place was corrupt. And by the way, it turns out we were right. All right, so put that as your, as your context. He's like, look, this is a corrupt place. I don't want to send them a bunch of money and have them waste it, have them spend it, have them use it to line their own pockets. Um, plus, I'm not sure that the other European countries are helping them out either. Uh, so we actually looked at that. During that time, before, when, the money, when, we, when we cut the money off, before the money actually flowed, because the money flowed by the end of the fiscal year, uh, we actually did an analysis of what other countries were doing uh, in terms of supporting Ukraine. And what we found out was that, and I can't remember if it's zero or near zero, dollars from any European countries for lethal aid. You've heard the President say this, that we give them tanks and the other, other countries give them pillows. Um, that's absolutely right, that the, the, is, as, as, as vocal as the Europeans are about supporting Ukraine, um, they are really, really stingy when it comes to lethal aid. Uh, and they weren't helping Ukraine, and that still to this day are not. And the President did not like that. So I, I know it was a long answer to your question, but I'm still going. So um, that was, those were the driving factors. Did he also mention to me in the past the, 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 the corruption related to the DNC server? Absolutely. No question about that. Um, but that's it. And that's why we held up the money. Now, there was a report. So, 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 so the demand for an investigation into the Democrats was part of the reason that he it was ordered to withhold funding to Ukraine. The, the look back to what happened in 2016 certainly was, was part of the thing that he was worried about in corruption with that nation. And that is absolutely appropriate. the funding. Yeah, which, which ultimately then flowed. By the way, there was a report that we were worried that the money wouldn't, if, if we didn't pay out the money, it would be illegal. Okay, it would be unlawful. Um, that is one of those things that is, has that little shred of truth in it um, that, that makes it look a lot worse than it really is. Uh, we were concerned about, in our, uh, over at OMB, about an impoundment. And I know I just put half of you folks to, to bed, but there's, a, there's the Budget Control Act, uh, impound, Budget Control Impoundment Act of 1974 says that if Congress s appropriates money, you have to spend it. Okay, at least that's how it's interpreted by some folks. And we knew that that money either had to go out the door by the end of September, or we had to have a really, really good reason not to do it. And that was the legality of the issue. But to be clear, what you just described is a quid pro quo. It is funding will not flow unless the investigation into the into the Democratic server uh, happened as well. We, we do we do that all the time with foreign policy. We were holding up money at the same time for, uh, what was it, the Northern Triangle com countries. We were holding up aid at the Northern Triangle countries so that they, uh, so that they would change their policies on immigration. By, by the way, and this speaks to it, this speaks to an important, I'm sorry, this speaks to an important point because I heard this yesterday and I can never remember the gentleman who tested, was McKinney, the guy, is that his name? For I don't, don't know him, he testified yesterday. And if you go, and if you believe the news reports, okay, because we've not seen any transcripts of this, the only transcript I've seen was Sondland's testimony morning, this morning. If you read the news reports and you believe them, what did McKinney say yesterday? Well, McKinney said yesterday that he was really upset with the political influence in foreign policy. That was one of the reasons he was so upset about this. And I have news for everybody, get over it. There's going to be political influence in foreign policy. I'm talking to Mr. Moving. Carl. Uh, that is going to happen. Elections have consequences. And foreign policy is going to change from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. And what you're seeing now, I believe, is a group of mostly career, politi uh, career bureaucrats who are saying, you know what, I don't like President Trump's politics, so I'm going to participate in this witch hunt that they're, that they're undertaking on the Hill. P elections do have consequences, and they should, and your foreign policy is going to change. Obama did it in one way, we're doing it a different way, and there's no Mr. problem Mulvaney. with that. Mulvaney. Yes, sir. What about Biden, though, Mr. Mulvaney? Did that, did just, that come into consideration when that I'm money sorry, was I don't know out? your name, but he's being very rude, so if you go ahead and ask your question. Uh, just to clarify and just yeah. to, to follow up on, on that question, so when you're saying that politics is going to be involved, yeah. the question here is not just about uh, a political uh, decisions about how you want to run the government. This is about investigating political Im opponents. Are you saying no, the DNC, that the DNC are you server that it's okay for uh, for the U.S. government to hold up aid? and require a foreign government to investigate political opponents of the president. Now, the D you're talking about looking forward to the next election. Even, We're talking the DNC. The DNC is still involved in this next election. Is that not correct? So, wait a second. So, so there's saying, hold on a second. No, let, let me ask to you. Investigate the DNC, so right? So let's look at this. The is the DNC political There's an ongoing of the There's an ongoing investigation by our Department of Justice into the 2016 election. I can't remember the person's name. Um, Durham, the Durham, okay? That's an ongoing investigation, right? So you're saying the President of the United States, the chief law enforcement person, cannot ask somebody to cooperate with an ongoing public investigation into wrongdoing? 
that's 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 just bizarre to me that you would think that you can't do that. And so, so you would say that it's fine to ask about the DNC, but not about Biden. So Biden is now Biden is running for the Democratic nomination, right? That's well, for 2020. He, that, so that, are you, that's are a, you that's a hypothetical because that did not happen here. No, no, but, but I would ask you. No, no. On the call, the president did ask about investigating the Bidens. Are you saying that the money that was held up, that that had nothing to do no, with the, the yeah, Bidens? No, the, the money held up had absolutely nothing to do with Biden. There's no question. And that was draw, the point draw, I made to you. And you're drawing a distinction. You're saying no, that it would there be were three, wrong three to Three factors. Money Again, I was, I was involved with the, uh, the process by which the money was held up temporarily, okay? Three issues for that. The corruption in the country, whether or not other countries were participating in the support of the Ukraine, and whether or not they were uh, cooperating in an ongoing investigation with our Department of Justice. That's completely legitimate. Yes, sir. Thank you. Regarding the Secretary uh, over at the State Department, the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asian uh, for European and Eurasian Affairs, George Kent, te reportedly testified that you asked him to step down from any uh, uh, issues regarding Ukraine. Is that true? Do you, uh, do you... Uh, who said that? It was George Kent. I'm sorry, I don't know who that is. Is that, the, is that somebody who testified this week? Yes. Uh, I, I, I don't believe I've ever talked to anybody named George Kent in my life, right. nor have I asked anybody to resign their position over this. Okay. And also, another thing is, is that there have been reports that you had, uh, that you had been uh, conducting a, a review of the, uh, of, the, of the phone call with uh, um, uh, with uh, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, the Ukrainian president, um, and uh, if the question is, what are you, what are you do? Uh, is that true? Do you do you acknowledge that you've been conducting that review, I mean, or, is the, or is, was the call just perfect as the president? We, 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 Again, no one here had any difficulty with the call. We do think the call is perfect. We don't think there's any difficulty with the call at all. I've read it several times. By the way, it was not on the call. Uh, I assumed my office was on the call. No one raised any difficulty with me on the call at all. I understand that, in fact, no one on the call in here thought there was any difficulty with it. Let's get to your point about what we're doing inside. So were, was this an attempt to actually uncover the whistleblower? Was that was the thing no. that this is No, no, no. Here's what it is. It's like, look, if, you, if, you get, <laughs> if you're having the House do what they're going to do, doesn't it simply make sense for us to sort of try and find out what happened? That, this, is, this is one of the questions I don't understand uh, from you folks that we get all the time, which is um, some of you have criticized us for uh, having a war room, okay? which we don't, by the way. You don't have a war room when you haven't done anything wrong. Uh, Clinton certainly had a war room. I think Nixon did, but they actually did something wrong. We didn't, so we don't have a war room. But at the same time, then when we say that, you say, well, you're not taking it seriously. Yeah, we are. I mean, we, we do. It's, it's part of what we do. Look, when you work for the Trump administration, you're used to this kind of attention, right? We, we know how to do this, and we do this, and we're preparing for it. Yes, we're having lawyers look at it. Yes, we're having our, our, our PR people looking at it. If we, didn't be, if we weren't doing that, we would be committing malpractice. But I don't think there's anything extraordinary that we're doing. We've been dealing with oversight from the, uh, from the Democrats since they took office. In fact, it's all we've been dealing with the Democrats since they took office, because we certainly certainly haven't been doing much legislating since they've been here. Yes, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm trying to get folks who haven't asked a question yet. Chief, um, in light of the depositions that we've heard, uh, do you believe that Rudy Giuliani's role as an outside advisor to the president is problematic? No, that's, that's the president's call. I mean, I, I, actually, Steve Scalise got to ask this, a similar question today on television. I thought his answer was great, which is, look, you may not like the fact. In fact, I think, understand from reading his opening testimony that Gordon Sondland didn't like the fact that Giuliani was involved and said that uh, in, in, his, in his testimony. Okay, that's great. Uh, you may not like the fact that, that Giuliani was involved. That's great. That's fine. It's not illegal. It's not impeachable. The president gets to use who he wants to use. The president wants to fire me today well, and hire right, somebody else he can't. From the, actual, like, the president gets to set foreign policy and he gets to choose who to do so. As long as it doesn't violate any law, okay, and he doesn't violate any laws regarding confidential information or classified material or anything like that, the president gets to use who he wants to do. Follow up, follow up on that. Yes. 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 Did the president direct you or anyone else to work with Rudy Giuliani? Um, yeah, the, um, when was it? There was a, a, the May meeting, and I think this has been widely reported. In fact, I think Sondland mentioned it in his testimony, and I'm pretty sure that Rick Perry mentioned it in his interview yesterday with the, with, the, uh, with the Wall Street Journal, that in the May meeting in the Oval Office that I was in, um, I think uh, Senator Johnson was there as well as uh, uh, Mr. Volcker was there, uh, the President asked Rick Perry to work with Mr. Giuliani. And did you think that that was appropriate when you were asked as well? 
I wasn't asked. You were not asked. No. That was my question. Were you or anyone else asked? Yeah, so you, I, and I think the answer to your so question you is that the, 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 the president told Rick Perry, who I think was sort of, you know, he was, the issue, uh, the, one of the reasons they were in there, obviously, talking about energy, that we were very interested in trying to get Ukraine uh, as an energy partner. That's why Mr. Perry, Secretary Perry, was so heavily involved. Um, and that's when, that's when the president said to Mr. Perry, yeah, go ahead and talk to Rudy. Yes, you haven't asked a question yet. Yes. Shat well, hold it. Shadow foreign policy. Look, that, that, that's, that's a term you're using. That's a, that's a pejorative. That's, what is a shadow foreign policy? The president asked. Channel. Normal. Cha who else is in the room? Rudy Gilles, uh, who's in the room when the president is having this conversation? Okay, it's uh, Gordon Solon, our ambassador to the EU. Uh, uh, Kurt Volker, who is our special designated envoy to the Ukraine. I sat next to Mike, Pe uh, Mike Pompeo yesterday at the meeting with, uh, with the congressional leaders, and I said, look, I understand I, I coordinated a coup against you by putting, um, by putting uh, Sondland and, uh, and Volker in charge of Ukraine policy. And he, he leans back to me and goes, you know, they both work for me. Uh, there, there's not, not a shadow policy here. The president is entitled to have whoever he wants to work. I'm 100 percent comfortable with that. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I did. I did. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. No problem. First, to follow on that question, can you describe the role that you played in pressuring Ukraine to investigate the Bidens? And secondly, yeah, um, can you walk us through the meeting? that President Trump was dangling over Volodymyr Zelensky to happen right here at the White House. What were the preconditions of that meeting and was investigating Burisma one of them? Uh, the, the first question you answer, the first answer to your question is none. I didn't have any, in, any, uh, what was your question? What did I do with, to Ukraine or something? Nothing. Did, did you do anything to pressure Ukraine to investigate the Bidens? No. So what's the second question? The second question is about the meeting the, the, that was supposed dangled? to happen no, here at the White one. House between the two presidents. Can, yeah, can um, you walk us through the discussions for that meeting? Uh, what was on the table for a precondition? And was the investigation of Burisma ever brought up uh, as a condition to meet with not, President Trump? No, not to me. Um, and not to anybody I know of. I was never in a conversation that, that had the word Burisma in it. Um, but as Sorry, to- Investigating the Bidens then. Okay, or the Bidens. That never happened with me in there. Um, but to the uh, to the larger point about the meeting, I think one of the things that you all have missed is the president didn't want to take the meeting. The president didn't want to have a phone call. Uh, that, that was that was that was that was Mr. Rick Perry was pushing well, for that. Well, he said, "I'll see you here at the White House," didn't he? Uh, at, the, at the end, yes. But that's I think that was a courtesy that he was extending at the time, and he's not been here yet. But so the, he was never realistically entertaining a meeting with President Zelensky. I mean, I, we we get asked by foreign leaders all of the time to either come visit their country or to have them come visit here. And we would try to be courteous and say yes, and some of them were able to accommodate and some of them we are not. But I do not remember, excuse me, I'm going to ask her a question, um, that I don't remember a serious conversation about setting up an actual meeting. There were no dates discussed. There was not, I, I saw that as one of the typical pleasantries that we have, and I don't think it was dangling a, a meeting or anything like that. Yes, sir. Is the president still planning to welcome President Erdogan at the White House on November 13th? Yeah, I think that, uh, I think that depends um, on how the next couple of days go. I, that we've, that's still on the schedule, um, and I understand that uh, 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 Vice President Pence's meeting is going much longer than it's expected today. I hope it's not going, I hope they're not having a press conference right now. Uh, but I think that's one of those wait and see things. Uh, the President's been very clear about what he wants to see out of President Erdogan. Um, he wants a ceasefire now. Um, he wants prisoners protected. He, 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 I think, go down the long list of the, of, uh, the things the President has mentioned to President Erdogan. Um, and if we're able to get that, then I think that meeting can go forward. If not, then I think the President will review that possibility. Yes, ma'am. Gordon you just said... You just, said, you just said you were involved in the process in which, you know, the money being held up temporarily, you named three issues for that, the corruption yeah. in the country, whether or not the country, they were assisting with an ongoing investigation of corruption. How is that not an establishment of, 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 of an exchange, of a quid pro quo? You just seem to... It's, it's quid pro quo. Those are the terms... Those are the terms that you use. I mean, go look at what Gordon Sondland said today in, in, his, in his testimony, was that um, I think... Uh, in his opening statement, he said something along the lines of they were trying to get the, the deliverable. And the deliverable was a statement by the Ukraine about how they were going to deal with corruption. Okay? Go read his testimony if you haven't already. And what he says is, and he's right, that's absolutely ordinary course of business. 
This is this is what you do when, when, when you when you um, uh, when you have someone come to the White House when you uh, either arrange a visit for the president, you have a phone call with the president. A lot of times we use that as the opportunity to get them to make a statement of their policy or to announce something that they're going to do. It's one of the reasons we can then you know you can you can sort of announce that at the uh, on the phone call or at the meeting. This is the ordinary course uh, of foreign policy. Yes, I'm sorry. Why, Mr. Mulvaney, is it appropriate for any president or this president to pressure a foreign country to investigate a political opponent? You know, every time I get that question, that's, that's one of those things about, uh, it is, but so is, uh, when did you stop beating your wife? It assumes that the president has done that. We're, we haven't done that. I'm going to talk about what this president did. Yes, ma'am. The president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, said he sees his work as the president's personal attorney as intertwined with the president's national agenda when it comes to Ukraine. Do you see those issues as intertwined? Is his political interest as a, as a president, as a political candidate, is that intertwined with the national interests? Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question, except that, uh, I mean, the, the, Mr. Giuliani is his personal lawyer, and the president wants to so use him. Is it appropriate for a personal attorney to be working in Ukraine on issues that are supposed to be national issues? The, Mr. Giuliani says there's an attorney-client privilege issue because he was working in the president's interest. Is that appropriate for his personal attorney to be working in his I, I don't know of anything inappropriate about that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. The lady in the back is very okay. nice. Thank yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mulvaney. Um, how you say that uh, the U.S. Uh, foreign policy will change, uh, in, uh, not like uh, in the previous uh, administrations. How does the president uh, respond about uh, North Korea's uh, break off talks with the U.S. recently? Um, if the question is uh, responding to breaking off talks, yes. is there news in the last couple of days on that? Yes, uh, October 5th, uh, Stockholm and Sweden. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm not. I, I, I'm just not briefed on that. I apologize. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mulvaney. Yeah, and I'll take one more after this. Uh, there have been published reports that you were objecting within the president's official family to the appointment of Ken Cuccinelli as uh, to head up the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, is that so? And if so, what is your objection to his possible appointment? Uh, I have none, and I think Ken will be good at the job. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, did, did I really ignore you the whole time you're sitting in the front row and I haven't asked you a question yet? I'm sorry. Same with me, Mr. Mulvaney. So, <laughs> so um, if, if there was no quick pro quo in the call, if it was routine, if he didn't want to do it, and, you know, it's all on the up and up, why did it, did it have to go into this more restrictive server? Why was it moved from the one server to the other? All right, let's, let's, uh, good, I'm glad we got that. It's a good one to, to finish on. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to answer your question the way you want me to, but I'm going to answer your question, so give me just a second. Uh, I am not going to sit here and talk about how we handle classified information in this building, okay? I got a couple questions before about my private conversations with the President. I don't talk about those either. I'm not going to talk about that, but I do want to address it, and here's why. There's only one reason people care about that, right? That's because they think there's a cover-up. They, 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 they hope there's a, some of them hope that there's a cover up, that, oh my goodness gracious, there must have been something really, really duplicitous, something really underhanded about how they handled this document. Because there must be a cover up, because there's always a good cover up when, they, when we've got an impeachment, right? Nixon had a cover up of the tapes, Clinton had a cover up of, of, of the relationship with Lewinsky. There must be a cover up here, right? Let me ask you this. If we wanted to cover this up, would we have called the Department of Justice almost immediately and had them look at the transcript of the tape? Which we did, by the way. Right? If we wanted to cover this up, would we have released it to the public? And by the way, I'm glad that now all of this concern about how the document has been edited and what do these ellipses stand for, because I heard Adam Schiff go on television yesterday, and, or yesterday the day before, and say, you know, we don't need to hear from the whistleblower anymore, because now we have the transcript of the memorandum of, of communication, memorandum of document. Okay? Everyone wants to believe there's a cover-up. You don't give stuff to the public and say, here it is if you're trying to cover something up. So I'm not going to answer your question by explaining uh, how we handle documents in this building. All I'm telling you is that you can stop asking the questions in there because there's no cover-up, and I can prove it to you by our actions. Look, I know we could do this all night. No, I'm not going to take any more, uh, but it's nice, it's nice to see everybody. Thanks again. All right.